Um, I have one very um, brief thing at the top, and then I'm happy to dive right into questions. So uh, let's start with uh, an update to the humanitarian response in Gaza and our efforts to move aid via the Humanitarian Maritime Corridor. Uh, the temporary pier is now in place and affixed, and we expect assistance to flow through this route in the coming days. Uh, the temporary pier, uh, part of the Humanitarian Maritime Corridor, is additive to the other routes and will assist humanitarian organizations uh, providing life-saving assistance. Aid is arriving in Cyprus. It will be screened for loading onto ships for delivery to Gaza, where humanitarian organizations, including trusted USAID and U.S. government partners, will determine how to ensure they reach those in need accordance to uh, humanitarian principles. Uh, although this is a new mechanism of assistance for Gaza, more, of course, must be done. Humanitarian conditions on the ground continue to de uh, deteriorate, and vital border crossings have closed at a time when moving more aid is critical. We are working tirelessly to surge assistance through all available means to address the impacts of this crisis. That's why the U.S. established a humanitarian maritime corridor to augment, not replace, ongoing efforts to scale the delivery of humanitarian aid by land. Uh, so let me be clear, we continue to press for all border crossings to be open for overland deliveries of aid, uh, but more must be done to address the scale of need. Uh, we have and will continue to press uh, Israel and other partners in the region uh, to allow for, uh, to ensure the safety of humanitarian actors and activities, open additional land crossings, and remove impediments to the delivery of humanitarian aid and do uh, more to make sure that aid can get to the places that it needs to go. Uh, so with that, Sean, do you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. L let me start with a peer. Sure. Um, the UN, uh, your counterpart of the UN, was saying today that uh, they're still looking operationally in terms of how to deliver aid, um, that there are concerns about safety, about the logistics, and paraphrasing of, of uh, to the UN workers there in Gaza, even if it comes off the pier. Uh, do you think these can be sorted out? I mean, I, I know that the, the pier is anchored today, but are you confident that delivery can actually happen and that those issues will be sorted out? We Absolutely. So um, we intend to work with the totality of the UN family uh, to make sure that uh, uh, aid uh, can get where it needs to go. Specifically, um, Sean, after the commodities are ashore, the UN through the logistics cluster will receive the aid uh, for humanitarian organizations, including uh, ones that I just said uh, that are trusted partners of the US government to distribute aid uh, inside Gaza. But, but do you think they do have those safety assurances that they're they're ready to go as far as the U.S. is? is We're continuing to have those conversations. From our point of view, uh, we believe that this is ready uh, to to go and for aid to start flowing um, uh, as soon as possible. And on a similar note, uh, Rafa, of course, is closed. And you, you spoke about opening yeah. uh, the, the Rafa crossing, and you spoke about opening uh, further crossings. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, I think it was yesterday, had some choice words for, for Egypt, saying that Egypt needs to, to act to open it. Uh, Egypt and, and also has responded quite forcefully, saying that uh, basically you know, Trump drivers don't really want to go essentially through an Israeli checkpoint to get in. Uh, how confident are you that, that these issues can be resolved? Is the U.S. trying to do anything to solve this? Well, we're certainly confident that they can be resolved because uh, they have been resolved at various, various instances over the course of this conflict. Um, the U.S. supports Israel's right to defend itself and uh, support taking every uh, feasible measure to protect civilians. Um, we are continue to be concerned uh, that travel uh, and the flow of fuel of aid into Gaza via Rafah has come to a complete halt. Uh, but we are continuing to work with the government of Egypt, with the government of Israel, to do everything we can to make sure that this uh, gets open as soon as possible. You've heard me talk a little bit about this before, that there are, of course, legitimate security and operational uh, concerns uh, uh, that are legitimate, and we're continuing to work through those processes. And do you, I mean, basically, do you think, do you agree that Egypt should just open it up? Uh, do you think it's more complicated than that? Or uh, worth uh, obviously, Sean, it is, it is uh, more complicated than just a simple 
they should just open it up. But this is something that we're continuing to work directly with uh, our partners in Egypt and our partners in Israel. There are obviously uh, legitimate issues that need to be ironed out. Uh, the important thing is, and this is something we know that our partners in Israel and our partners in Egypt understand, Rafa is an important conduit for aid, for fuel, and for every day uh, that it is closed, um, that is uh, aid and fuel not getting in um, through that conduit. Uh, just, just one more, I'll, I'll yeah. pass on. But um, just wondering if you have any reaction to the Arab League uh, emergency meeting. Uh, there are two main takeaways. One, they want a, a regional summit or a peace conference on, on what's going on now. And also, speaking of UN uh, or UN-backed peacekeepers in the Palestinian territories. So uh, let me say a, a couple things on that, Sean. First, um, in terms of any summit, I, I don't have anything to offer there beyond saying, you know, this is something that we have engaged in regularly with our partners in the Arab world. Uh, you all are abreast of the engagements that the secretary has, both in person as well as uh, the engagements he has over the phone. We'll continue to uh, talk directly with our, our partners um, in the Arab world. Uh, and as it relates to any uh, security or um, uh, uh, peacekeeping force, you know, we have uh, first and foremost been focused on bringing a uh, conclusion to this conflict. We have been having conversations with partners in the region about a post-conflict Gaza. Uh, early on in this conflict, we've begun those conversations. Uh, many partners, uh, both in and out of the Arab world, share uh, our concerns and share a willingness to play a constructive role when conditions allow. Uh, but there is a, a convergence on uh, uh, among among many of them that we need to see this conflict end. We need to see a ceasefire. We need to see hostages released. We need to see more humanitarian aid getting in, and we need to uh, see the space for the diplomacy to happen to get us on a path uh, for a Palestinian state and see some progress for the Palestinian people. So we're gonna work through that process first. Uh, on this, uh, uh, don't, if you don't mind, the, the, I'll come to you after. can you give us a more clearer answer if you support the deployment of UN forces in Gaza until the uh, uh, implementation of the two-state solution that the Arab summit called for today? So we've seen the statement that's coming out of the Arab summit. I just don't have a, a, a conclusive assessment to offer yet, Michelle. Uh, in general, do you support such uh, deployment? So look, we uh, th th this is a uh, this is something that uh, we under know that Israel is focused on um, in uh, working to defeat Hamas. Um, uh, candidly, the uh, addition of ad additional security forces could potentially put that uh, mission into compromise. But again, um, I don't want to get ahead of the process here, and uh, we're just now seeing what the statement that's come out of uh, this, um, this summit. Daphne, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Martin Griffiths warned today that famine was an immediate risk in Gaza with food stocks running out, said the humanitarian operation was completely stuck, the relief operation was unplannable, and said that the consequences of an operation in Rafa that everyone warned about are coming true. Do you agree with that assessment? So we are deeply concerned about the reports indicating uh, worsening conditions and imminent famine in Gaza. Israel needs to uh, do more to urgently provide sustained and unimpeded access uh, for humanitarian assistance to enter both northern and southern Gaza, including uh, facilitating efforts to get the right type of assistance uh, to the most vulnerable. Uh, we have been very clear about our position uh, on a major military operation in Rafa. While we, of course, support Israel's rights to defend itself, we believe a major military operation in Rafa would be a mistake. Uh, we have not seen uh, that happen yet, uh, but we're very concerned about an expanded operation in Rafa and what it could do uh, to contributing towards the worsening humanitarian crisis. Uh, so we are going to continue to engage with our partners in Israel on this, discuss with them alternatives and other avenues, and we'll continue to have that conversation. And do you have an updated number on aid trucks getting into Gaza? So 228 uh, trucks crossed into Gaza on May 15th, including 136 trucks from Jordan and Israel through Karim Shalom and 92 trucks through Erez West. Uh, additionally, the World Food Program collected 55, 56, sorry, 56 trucks worth of wheat flour at Eras West on May 15th.
And then do you have any update on the group of American citizens who are doctors and medical professionals that had been stuck in Gaza since the closing of Rafah? So we are continue to be aware of the reports of U.S. citizen doctors currently unable to leave Gaza. We, of course, continue to be concerned about their safety and well-being, as we are the safety and well-being of all U.S. citizens in Gaza. As you've heard me say, this is a very complex situation. Uh, this is not uh, a border crossing, specifically the Rafa one. Uh, it is not one that the United States controls, but we are actively engaged with the relevant authorities to advocate for their safe departure from Gaza. We're continuing to have those conversations. We're in direct touch uh, with these doctors and the group that they are a part of, as well as their families. Well, yeah. Yeah. But I just want to repose this question, uh, given your exchange just now with Daphne. I mean, it was a few days after the World Central Kitchen strike on April 1st that both the President and the Secretary have said, said that uh, a change in U.S. policy would come if Israel didn't improve the humanitarian aid front. So it's a month and a half later. Are there any consequences being thought about, considered by the administration? specifically in response to the humanitarian aid problem? Well, uh, Olivia, I think it's important to remember, and uh, you were here when um, uh, Ambassador Satterfield came to this briefing. Actually, I'm not sure you were here. Not here you were not here. You were in, in Capri having a, having a blast oh, with, sure. with the rest of the whole thing. <laughs> um, when Ambassador Satterfield was here, he spoke about the progress that we have seen, did see, uh, in that time period when it came to sustained humanitarian assistance. Uh, there, of course, has been uh, a bit of a regression, uh, given large part due to some of the kinetic activity that we've seen around Karim Shalom, kinetic activity that we've seen around uh, the Rafa border crossing. Uh, and that is understandable. But simultaneously, we continue to press and engage directly with the Egyptians, with the Israelis, that we need to do everything we can to turn these border crossings on so that more sustained humanitarian aid can get into Gaza. And should we not see sustained progress, um, the president and the secretary were quite clear. And that, uh, uh, and, and, and that statement continues to ring true. Okay. I mean, just underscoring the fact that it was a month and a half ago, I understand there were some progress, but... There was progress. There was, a, there was progress. Sustained. And again, it, because of, uh, largely because of kinetic activity from Hamas, in fact, we have seen some of these border crossings unfortunately close, and we are working around the clock with our partners in Israel, with our partners in Egypt, uh, as it relates to the Rafa one especially, to do everything we can to, to turn those back on. But there's no timeline or deadline that you're working with. There was not a timeline or a deadline when we uh, spoke about when we spoke about this at the beginning of April. This is a, a frank and direct. This is a frank and direct conversation that we'll continue to have with our partners in Israel, and we want to continue to see uh, immediate uh, and sustained uh, flow. I obviously uh, was able to provide some uh, metrics here. We are seeing some positive steps in the right direction. The uh, uh, cooperation um, from a number of reason, regional partners as it relates to the maritime corridor will, of course, be uh, a positive step in the right direction. We want to continue to see more, and we uh, intend to, to raise that if we don't. Tangential but related, because the, the president and secretary also stressed the importance of establishing a better deconfliction mechanism. Yeah. So where do Israel's efforts on that stand? as you understand that. So uh, I spoke a little bit about this the other day. This is something we continue to uh, uh, need to see from our partners in Israel. Uh, it is critical that uh, Estelle is established to improve deconfliction, uh, one that is uh, uh, reflective of enabling open and transparent communication channels between the IDF and other uh, humanitarian partners, and that is something that we're going to continue to to, to press them on. So just to be crystal clear, what a deconfliction cell within the IDF does not currently exist. So there are pictures of Jack Liu getting a tour of some. There, there has been uh, progress in some of those uh, spaces, but uh, we uh, still need to see more. And I'm happy to see if we have a breakdown of 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 what exists currently and what doesn't. And in fact, the IDF might be uh, better suited to to speak to efforts that they have in place versus not. I have one more with your and the press corps indulgence. Uh, just because the secretary said yesterday that it was imperative that Israel come up with a clear and credible plan for post-war Gaza. Obviously, you've seen um, comments from the prime minister. In response to those, uh, do you have any indication that the current Israeli government, apart from the defense minister, uh, is interested in crafting uh, such a plan? So uh, 
whether there is an interest in uh, crafting uh, a plan or not, I will let it to our partners in Israel to speak to. Uh, what we know and what we feel uh, ardently in the United States is that uh, short of a plan uh, that is uh, uh, reflective of a political process, that is reflective of a uh, Gaza that is no longer under the control of Hamas and reunited under the Palestinian Authority, that is reflective of a Gaza that can no longer be used as a springboard for terrorism on, on the Israeli people, um, that we're going to continue to be caught in this endless cycle of violence. Uh, and so that is exactly why Secretary Blinken has continued to engage in direct diplomacy with partners in Israel, with partners uh, in other parts of the world, uh, to get us onto that process, to uh, do everything possible to get us a ceasefire so conditions can be created for further diplomacy to happen, uh, to get us on a path to a two-state solution. Uh, outside of that, uh, outside of that, we will continue to find ourselves uh, in this endless cycle of violence. Of course, we need military pressure to defeat Hamas, uh, but there also needs to be a political process that is reflective of, uh, of, of the, the broader uh, concerns here. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Peter, uh, on China yeah. and Russia. Regarding the summit meeting between China and Russia, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Putin said in a statement from the <coughs> summit that they oppose pressure on North Korea by the U.S. and its allies. How will expectation about influence change as China and Russia defend North Korea. We've long felt that Russia and the PRC have a role to play in helping uh, rein in and uh, engage the DPRK when it comes to their provocative um, and uh, reckless and malign and destabilizing behavior. We believe that uh, Russia and the PRC have the capabilities and the channels and the relationships with the DPRK to do that directly through their own bilateral relationship, but also um, through multilateral fora like the Security Council as well. If uh, Putin visits <clears throat> North Korea after his visit to China, the solidarity between North Korea and China and Russia will be further strengthened. How do you assess this? So, um, I don't think it's about the solidarity between the DPRK and the Russia being further strengthened or not. We know that uh, the DPRK has uh, and continues to provide material support to the Russian Federation for their aggression uh, in Ukraine. Um, and so uh, we continue to condemn that kind of action and we'll continue to take appropriate action to hold actors accountable. Can, can I just uh, just ask a little bit more broadly about that about, sure. about uh, Putin and Xi? Yeah, uh, absolutely. What, what, what do you think of it? I mean, was there anything new? I mean, obviously they met right before the the war, maybe. After, but what, what do you um, do you see anything new about that? And particularly when it comes to Ukraine, uh, President Xi made some talk about. Uh, for the one escalation, et cetera. Uh, what, do you see anything new there? How do you see this? this well, let me say a, a couple of things, Sean. First is that uh, the People's Republic of China cannot uh, have its cake and eat it too. We, you can't have it both ways. You can't uh, want to have good, further, stronger, deepened relationships with Europe and other countries while simultaneously continuing to fuel the biggest threat to European security um, in a long time. Uh, and the importance of this is not just a U.S. position. It is one that is shared by our partners in the G7, our partners at NATO, our partners in the EU. Uh, fueling Russia's defense industrial base, as the People's Republic of China has, not only threatens Ukrainian security, it threatens European security. And Beijing can't achieve uh, better relations with uh, Europe while also continuing to support um, uh, something like this. I, I will also say that um, in just coming coming down, I saw um, something as it relates to what looked like a joint statement or some language coming out of this meeting that talked about, uh, as you mentioned, concerns about de-escalation, sorry, concerns about escalation, wanting some kind of uh, peace process or political solution to the conflict in Ukraine. From our point of view, the solution is simple. Uh, the Russian Federation can just leave Ukraine. It can leave the territories that it's in in Ukraine. It can leave Crimea, and um, we'll have our uh, peaceful solution. Uh, but time and time and time again, President Putin and the Russian Federation um, has uh, indicated that they are not interested uh, in doing that. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Anne. So if I could go back to the aid workers, the medical workers sure. in Gaza. 
Um, you had mentioned that we don't control the Rafah border crossing. That's what's complicated it. But Israel does control Karim Shalom. Why can these workers not leave Karim Shalom and Israel allow other aid workers in to replace them? Is the complication on Israel's side, or is it? It's a first. Or? It's a it's a complicated situation writ large. Um, uh, there what are, are the varying factors uh, that go into where foreign nationals can depart from Gaza or not. Um, Karim Shalom is also not a border crossing that the United States controls. Uh, but we're engaging and advocating directly with our partners in Israel, with our partners in Egypt, uh, for their safe departure, uh, and that continues to be around the clock uh, effort. And I don't, I'm not going to speak to it more specificity. One for privacy reasons, but also uh, given um, security sensitivities. Okay, if as I could well. follow up to what Olivia was asking as well, as three weeks ago we had Ambassador Satterfield here mm -hmm. saying we need to start doing more than just counting trucks. We're still counting trucks. It, it's what is the consequence for not allowing medical aid workers in, which I would equate with humanitarian aid? It, it, it absolutely is. We have been clear that humanitarian aid workers need to have access uh, to Gaza to do the important work that they're doing, whether it be medical or otherwise, or whether it be direct humanitarian workers who are directly involved in the flow of humanitarian aid. That continues to be the, the case here. It's also important to remember that we are talking about American citizens. We're also talking about this in the context of a consular issue. Um, and so while um, it is great that they are humanitarian aid workers doing important work, uh, they are American citizens also. They're American citizens first. Uh, and so we're talking about a consular issue and doing everything we can to make sure that we can get them uh, to safety. That being said, we continue to believe that he, those working in this field of, of humanitarian aid and humanitarian issues need to have unimpeded access to do this important work. Uh, Rabia, go ahead. Thank you. Following up on these humanitarian aid uh, yeah. questions in Gaza, uh, so in the NSM report, you say that Israel is not deliberately, deliberately restricting aid, but you also say today that you continue to press Israel uh, to allow entry of more humanitarian aid into Gaza. So if Israel is not restricting aid, uh, then what prevents Israel from allowing more aid into Gaza? Con you know, to do land cross crossings, considering that, you know, these land crossings are it under Israeli control. So, Arabia, there are, of course, legitimate logistical concerns and legitimate security challenges that sometimes need to be worked through. Let's remember that one of the reasons that uh, the aid was throttled uh, from Karim Shalom last week was because of kinetic activity from Hamas, Hamas attacking um, Karim Shalom and the surrounding region. Uh, so there are some of these legitimate security concerns that we need to work through. We, Israel has every right to uh, its security and to ensure that the aid that is flowing uh, within Gaza uh, is flowing in a secure way, uh, in a way that does not uh, uh, compromise uh, their security further. Uh, so we're continuing to work with them through these processes. Uh, but that being said, we have been uh, explicit that more needs to be done to augment uh, humanitarian aid efforts, uh, especially through these land crossings. So Israel, Israel is not uh, doing enough, but you still think that they are not deliberately restricting the aid? So I think I was pretty clear when I think you asked this question uh, just the other day, which is that uh, more absolutely can be done to enhance the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza, but we have not seen any uh, restriction or stoppage of humanitarian aid by Israel. Aid is flowing into Gaza. I just gave your colleagues some metrics about aid that has uh, that was flowing uh, yesterday, and we'll continue to provide updates as frequently as we can. Said, go ahead. Thank you, Vidan. Sorry for being late. No, you're good. Very quickly on, on the aid. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe you touched upon it. Uh, are you aware that the, the Israelis or Israeli settlers have uh, destroyed or, you know, uh, stopped five trucks? I'm going in. I, I've seen some of those reports, Said. I don't, uh, I can't offer. The, the Jordanian. The you, yeah. I've seen some of those reports, Said. I can't offer a, a technical assessment of where those trucks are in their path or their flow to their ultimate endpoint, or whether that aid was able to be uh, rerouted or not. What I can say, though, is that humanitarian aid must not and cannot be uh, restricted, stopped, or interfered with. And our partners in Israel need to uh, do more to 
hold um, actors like this accountable when uh, action is taken that is inconsistent with uh, uh, what we know is, is important, which is getting more humanitarian aid into Gaza. So what is your position on the uh, Rafah crossing? You know, at, at the present time, the status so of the Rafah crossing. We just spent a lot of time talking about Rafah. I know you were tardy, no, no, no. but I, I, if you, I will, I will encapsulate it briefly for you, which is that we need, uh, we are working around the clock with our partners in Egypt and Israel to do everything we can to get the Rafah crossing open. Uh, due to it being coal closed, uh, unfortunately, there has been a stoppage of aid and fuel flowing into Gaza via Rafah. Uh, there are some legitimate operational and security concerns and challenges that we're continuing to work through, uh, but uh, we recognize how dire and how important it is that this crossing open as swiftly as possible. And lastly, yeah. I mean, yesterday marked the 76th anniversary of the Palestinian uh, Nakba, and of course uh, the Palestinians commemorated it in the shadow of the ongoing war in Gaza. So incredibly, not, not only that the issue was not resolved, over a period of 76 years. But there's a second Nakba ongoing. I mean, you know, there's the movement of people, 600,000 here and 600,000 there and so on. And I remember what the Secretary of State said just before the seven, that you know, the time has come for the Palestinians to live in a measure of dignity, much like the Israelis and so on. So had the time come to really end this Nakba and allow the Palestinian, you know, uh, the measure of dignity that the Secretary talked about, in their own land? We're working around the clock site. We're working around the clock to make it so. We are committed uh, to reaching uh, a, an immediate ceasefire here that secures the release of hostages and allows the surge of humanitarian aid. In addition to that, we believe that such a ceasefire could create the diplomatic conditions for further serious progress to be made. Talking about Israel's further integration in the Middle East, talking about uh, putting uh, the region on a pathway to a two-state solution um, so that Israelis and Palestinians can live uh, those equal measures of justice, dignity, and peace. So we have not taken our eyes off the ball here, which is a ultimately a two-state solution, so we can uh, get to that ultimate goal. So you feel uh, that the time has come to end this Palestinian Nakba? Said, what I can say is that we have long been and continue to be committed to a two-state solution, and we're working around the but clock of that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not that that's ongoing catastrophe I has do not not come to end it. Said, I do not. I do not dispute the suffering of the Palestinian people uh, and that uh, their current uh, experiences that the Palestinian people are facing, not just. Uh, in, in Gaza, but um, living under occupation in the West Bank. I'm not trying to dispute that at all. What I'm saying is that we are continuing to work around the clock to get us a conclusion of the current hostilities and get us on a path to further diplomacy to get us to a two-state solution. That's what the secretary is deeply committed to, as is President Biden. I'm sorry, but the, the current hostilities are rooted, you know, in the a catastrophe that has been going on for 60, the 76 years. It's not, the current it's hostilities, not something that just happened. Respectfully, Saeed, the current hostilities are rooted in uh, uh, Hamas unleashing a terrorist attack on right. Israel on October 7th, rooted in their vision of in, in ensuring that Israel is eliminated from the face of the planet. You're not rooted in what happened in 1948. I, Hamas has been very clear about what their intentions no, are. No, I'm not talking about Hamas. I'm, I'm, gonna, talking, about, I'm, gonna, I'm talking about that this issue has gone on for 76 years. I just want you to acknowledge that the issue has been going on for 76 years and not just be, it, it did not begin on October I think we've exhausted this topic side go ahead yeah you, yeah, yeah. Hi, um Daniela Compatangelo for the Italian television La Sette. Uh -huh. So uh, if you can talk a little bit more about uh, the meeting with um, uh, between Xi Jinping and President uh, and um, Mr. Putin um, regarding also um, the sanctions that the US today or yesterday the president um, um, announced. I don't think they were sanctions. Pardon me? They were not sanctions. I mean, for import and export yeah, yeah. to the U.S. We call them tariffs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you can talk a little bit more about that, and then I have another question. Sure. So, uh, where would you like me to start specifically? From the first part. Uh, about. So let's start from the meeting. As it relates to the meeting between President Xi and President Putin, I think I, uh, I think I, uh, I exhausted that topic with Sean, but I will just. Uh, say again that uh, in our view, the People's Republic of China can't have it 
uh, both ways. You can't purport to claim to want to deepen and strengthen your relationships with Europe while continuing to fuel one of the biggest threats to uh, European uh, security in, uh, in many, many decades. Uh, as it relates to the announcement uh, of, of tariffs earlier this week, uh, you're seeing the president take action to protect American workers and businesses from what we believe to be China's unfair uh, trade practices. Uh, American workers and businesses can outcompete anybody uh, as long as the competition is fair. But for too long, uh, uh, the PRC has been playing by a different set of rules, using uh, unfair and anti-competitive economic practices. Uh, so we, what this is, is uh, working with our allies to uh, join forces in outcompeting China by building alliances abroad and producing jobs uh, here at home. And uh, if I can do a follow-up question China? about what you just said, yeah. um, I don't know if you're aware. For instance, Italy um, have signed some sort of agreement with the Chinese, and the President Xi Jinping was in Europe uh, in last week. Um, and the who, Chinese... Who signed an agreement? Sorry. Uh, also Italy. In Italy, in uh, Italy right. uh, Chinese yeah. electric car will be start being in, imported, um, I believe, next year. So how, do, how does the U.S. try to manage... Um, I mean, the Chinese that trying to have business with Europe, as, I, as you know, because they have to, and then also they're trying to put their nose... In, in Ukraine. So it looks like they're trying to... So, so look, let me just say this, and uh, the U.S., United States is not, of course, party to this, but uh, we welcome investment and trade that promotes sustainable and responsible development and growth. But we continue to urge, in all cases, the need to emphasize transparency, sustainable financing, sustainable practices, and preservation of national and data security to ensure uh, mutual benefit for uh, the United States, Italy, and other partners. And that is something we have not always seen as it re relates to investments and trade practices by the People's Republic of China in countries around the world. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, just back on the putin Xi meeting, yeah. the secretary went to China recently and expressed concerns over its growing cooperation with Russia. And yet this meeting is happening now, and they pledged a new era of partnership. Are you concerned that the trip was an unsuccessful attempt to stem this relationship? And is there anything more you can do to put the brakes on it? So absolutely not. The trip was not unsuccessful. Uh, you have to remember that our engagements with the, the People's Republic of China is multifaceted. Uh, and one of the key components of this uh, of the secretary's visit was to build on some of the key deliverables that came out of President Biden and President Xi's uh, Woodside Summit. We're talking about uh, enhancing cooperation on fentanyl, uh, additional military to military uh, communication, uh, collaboration in other areas. And we think, uh, not we think, we know that focusing on those issues um, it continues to allow us to manage this relationship responsibly, manage competition responsibly, which is what the world expects of international powers. Uh, that being said, surely uh, we also believe that the People's Republic of China's essential reconstitution of Russia's defense industrial base um, is mm. deeply problematic, and we will monitor this space closely and take appropriate actions independently through other uh, multilateral fora should we need. And we continue to uh, say directly, and we have, uh, the secretary has been direct on this with his counterparts, that uh, the, the PRC cannot have it both ways. Sorry, what sort of actions? I'm saying we uh, stand ready to take additional actions should necessary as it relates to uh, the PRC and any entities for their uh, further support of, uh, of, of Russia and its aggression in Ukraine. So what sort of actions? Can so I think I'm not going to preview actions from up here, Daphne. I think you've been covering the department long enough to, to, to know that. But uh, the, the United States has a number of tools at its disposal uh, to, to hold uh, folks accountable. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Uh, on Ukraine, uh, yeah. going back to Secretary Street, he's yeah. back. I was wondering if you could, could give us some uh, sort of his first-hand assessment and his level of concern on the uh, situation in Kharkiv. How, uh, just how serious this has become during the past couple of hours. So we've uh, uh, we spoke a little bit about this um, earlier this week, Alex. Obviously, the situation is incredibly dire. Um, we know that this is a challenging time, but uh, we are sure that military aid is also going to make a real difference on the battlefield. The secretary yesterday announced 
uh, $2 billion in additional uh, assistance in foreign military financing uh, to establish not just the Ukraine Defense Enterprise Program and further enhance Ukraine's uh, capability to defend against Russia and its continued assault as well. If you on Russia, if I may, at the case of uh, Gordon Black, uh, there are reports on Russian media that he pleaded guilty. I don't want to dignify everything they said, but they said that he, he, accused, he was accused of stealing from his girlfriend, but uh, he admitted that. Is there any uh, development on your end, any council access? Or? There's, a, there's, There continues to be a limit to what I can say, Alex, given privacy considerations. This is a, a circumstance in which the department is continuing to seek consular access. We have not uh, been able to obtain it yet, but when any American citizen is detained abroad, uh, we ensure uh, to do everything possible. Uh, we take their security and safety incredibly seriously. And most importantly, we continue to press for consular access. And that works. have going. denied by now. I, as I've said, we are continuing to uh, seek consular access. One more follow-up, if I may. Also, Kurmashova, this week marks, as you know, seven months since her wrongful detention. Uh, any update on her case? Uh, I don't have any uh, updates for you specifically, um, Alex, but we have no higher priority than the safety and security of U.S. citizens overseas. We continue to remain deeply concerned about Alsu's uh, case, and we condemn in the strongest possible terms that the Kremlin's continued attempts to intimidate and repress journalists and civil society voices. You, you know, the president of the United States is on the record, you know, twice calling Putin to, to release her. How do you expect, you know, her, her captives, someone like Putin, to take him seriously if his own State Department is slow walking the process? Uh, I would dispute that premise, Alex. We are certainly not slow walking the process. There is a del deliberative process at play here in terms of any uh, formal wrongful detention designation, but uh, we would echo the president and that uh, she should be released. Olivia, go Sorry, ahead. Just one thank you. Um, follow up on, on Ukraine, because yeah. Roland Key of the Secretary was asked about conditions that this administration has imposed on American weapons being sent to Ukraine, namely that they not be used to strike in Russian territory. The secretary said that the U.S. had not enabled or encouraged such attacks, but then added that it was up to the Ukrainians to decide how to conduct this war. And to some, that sounded like it might have been a loosening of this policy. So I just wanted you to clarify whether there has been any change in how the U.S. is thinking about the weapons that it's sending to the Ukrainians. Could they be used to strike beyond Ukrainians? So certainly not uh, a policy change. Our policy has not changed. And the secretary was clear about this. We do not encourage uh, or enable strikes on Russian territory, uh, but repeatedly we've also said that Ukraine ultimately makes its own decisions about its military strikes and its operations. And that continues to be the case. Would they face consequences if they used American weapons? You know how I feel about hypotheticals, Olivia, so I'm just going to uh, leave it at that. Go ahead, you had your hand up in the back. Thank you, um, Vedant. Uh, Mark Stone from uh, Sky News. Uh -huh. um, if I could just take a step back on, on Gaza. Sure. How have we got to a place where families children are now being displaced multiple times. The borders are hardly open. Heavy bombing and fighting has returned to the north of Gaza and to central Gaza. How have we got here? Well, we got here in large part because of Hamas's continued uh, belligerence and their continued uh, choice to use civilians as human shields. But and their you, choice to... Interrupt. How long can you only blame Hamas for this? Because... That seems to be what you do an awful lot. Hamas should take a huge amount of blame, of course. But what about the other side? We have been when we have been very clear, and I have been clear from this podium, as has the secretary and has Matt, when um, Israel or any partner or any ally has uh, done something that we have felt not meant the mark, or when we have seen actions that are uh, inconsistent with our values, or seen actions that are inconsistent with our goal for the region, we have not. Um, hesitated uh, to, to speak to them. So I kind of reject the, 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 your, your premise there. Uh, and as it relates to blaming Hamas, let's not forget that, again, Hamas is a terrorist organization. They uh, have stated it is their intent to destroy uh, Israel, to uh, erase Israel off the face of the planet. Uh, they've also said that they would like to conduct on October 7th over and over again if they could. And when we talk about uh, ending this conflict, um, it is Hamas that has continued to move the goalposts. It is Hamas that has continued to not take uh, the deals that have been on the table that would have allowed for this uh, conflict uh, to reach a ceasefire, that would have allowed for hostages uh, to be released. So if I can follow up, um, the, the premise of your answer seems to be, uh, your first answer seems to be uh, that the Americans have been talking, have been influencing, 
What are American words worth these days? What is American influence worth? I think American influence is worth quite a bit, and it is because of American engagement and American leadership and American diplomacy, specifically by this secretary and by this president, that we have seen things uh, unfold in a certain way. We have seen humanitarian aid be unlocked. We have seen things like this new maritime corridor be accomplished. Uh, I am certainly not trying to say that it is enough, but it is a step in the right direction. Let's not forget that at the beginning of this conflict, there was uh, close to little humanitarian aid flowing into Gaza at all. And it is because of Secretary Blinken and President Biden that uh, we are trending in a different direction. But we're not. It's going backwards. The fighting has returned. The borders have shut. People are being displaced repeatedly. Things are plainly going backwards, not forwards. We have been clear that there needs to be some uh, progress made as it relates to some backward steps in the past couple of weeks, but there has been a sustained period in which we saw an increase of humanitarian aid, and we're going to continue to work that directly. Nick, go um, ahead. On Cuba, yeah. state removed Cuba from the list of countries not fully cooperating against terrorism. That's right. Can you explain a little of that rationale, and also is this a prelude to Cuba no longer being considered a state sponsor of terrorism? Let me um, start with that second part first. So the designation of a state sponsor of terrorism is a totally uh, separate process from an NFCC certification. Uh, there have been countries certified as NFCCs without being designated as state sponsors of terrorism uh, and vice versa. Uh, U.S. law establishes specific statutory criteria for rescinding any um, state sponsor of terrorism designation and any review of Cuba's status on this would need to be based on the law and the criteria established by Congress. Uh, so to take a, a step back on this NFCC progress, the, the process, sorry, the department determined that the circumstances for Cuba's certifications as a not fully cooperating country have changed from 2022 to 2023. Uh, first, Cuba's refusal to engage with Colombia on extradition requests for National Liberation Army members supported Cuba's NFCC certification for 2022. In August of 2022, pursuant to an order from Colombian President Petro, Colombia's Attorney General announced that arrest warrant would be suspended against uh, 17 uh, ELN commanders, including those whose extradition uh, Colombia had previously requested from Cuba. Moreover, the U.S. and Cuba resumed law enforcement cooperation in 2023, including on counterterrorism. Therefore, we've determined that Cuba's continued certification as a not fully cooperating country was no longer appropriate. Um, I will also say that, just uh, since you've given me the opportunity, Nick, sales of defense articles to Cuba will continue to be restricted under Section 40 of the Arms Export Control Act, given Cuba's status as a state sponsor of terrorism. Moreover, Cuba remains subject to a incredibly comprehensive embargo still. Um, okay, just follow up on that. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, Pompeo, when he, when he added Cuba back to the list, he explicitly raised the ELN issue uh, as, a, as a reason that it was being added to this piece of uh, of terror. I, I realize there's a different process for that, but uh, I mean, the Cubans have said that this is you know, a political decision to keep them as a state sponsor. I mean, are, is it? I mean, is it? Uh, why, how can they still be considered a state sponsor of terrorism if... They are cooperating on counterterrorism, as, as this report said. So you can still you can be a, a cooperator on counterterrorism, but we still believe that there are actions that they are undertaking that are uh, of the support of uh, uh, terrorist activities. I'm not going to get into those specifically from up uh, up here. Uh, but again, Sean, uh, should any uh, statutory criteria change? Uh, on rescinding the SST designation, we would uh, work on that based on the law and uh, the criteria established by by Congress. Is there anything specifically you need them to do to to remove that? Sweet I just wouldn't speak to the the, the deliberative process on, on that from up here. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not yes. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Badan. Thank you. Uh, after the meeting with the visiting Assistant Secretary Donna Lu, Bangladesh's. Uh, a ruling prime minister advisor told the reporters that White House and the State Departments are very much willing to remove the sanction as U.S. imposed sanction on RAB Rapid Action Battalion for the extreme violation of human rights and extrajudicial killing. So he said that the State Department and 
White House working to remove the sanctions. Those claims are false. The U.S. is not withdrawing sanctions against the RAB. Those claims are false. Sanctions are intended to change behavior and promote uh, accountability. And one more, he said. They, I'm going to work. I have a hard out, so I'm going to try to get to as many people. Work. Go ahead. Um, so first, uh, can you confirm that the administration has notified Congress of a $1 billion arms package for Israel? I just wouldn't speak to uh, uh, arms transfers that have not been formally notified uh, to Congress. I wouldn't speak to those from up here. Um, and uh, when will aid begin going through the uh, pier? You missed my top projects. Yeah, and you were late. Yeah, I apologize for being yeah. late. So uh, I, uh, what I had said at the beginning was uh, we hope that aid will begin uh, flowing uh, very soon. It will be uh, pre-screened uh, in Cyprus and then on its way uh, to Gaza. And finally, uh, what's your reaction to South Africa telling the ICJ that Israel's, quote, genocide has continued at pace and has reached a new and horrific stage, end quote? We have been uh, pretty clear about uh, the fact that we uh, do not believe that what is um, happening in, in Gaza is uh, is genocide, and we continue to believe that those uh, uh, claims are uh, unwarranted and false. Thank Gita, you, go ahead. Thanks, Vadan. Two questions on Turkey. Okay. Um, today, a Turkish court convicted former leading officials from the pro-Kurdish HDP party, including the jailed Kurdish leader Salatin Demirtas, to more than 40 years in prison for instigating the 2014 protest triggered by an Islamic State um, attack on the Syrian Kurdish town of Kobani. I was wondering if the State Department has any comments on this verdict. So uh, we're continuing to monitor that situation, Gita, but let me check with the team and see if we have anything more specific for you. Okay, um, we'll just follow up, uh, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, Demetrius on the HDP. He's got a little <laughs> was dynamic included, duo here. <laughs> was uh, included in the State Department's 2023 annual uh, Human Rights Country Report um, uh, in Section 3, Freedom to Participate in the Political Process. Do you think the, the verdict today... Um, it's a violation of human rights. So let me just say we will raise and discuss human rights uh, with all of our partners uh, bilaterally. And that, of course, continues to uh, include Turkey. But again, on this specific situation, I'm going to uh, check with the team before I, I offer anything more specific. Michelle. Yeah, thank you. I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, Saudi conference uh, has met today with the Syrian president in Bahrain. Are you OK with your allies uh, normalizing their relations with uh, the Assad? regime or with uh, President Assad? We have been, uh, our position's clear on this. We will not normalize relations with the, the Assad regime until there is meaningful progress towards a political solution consistent with uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2254. Uh, we engage uh, consistently with Arab League members, uh, encouraging them to press and push uh, the Assad regime to make meaningful change. Uh, we are, of course, skeptical for obvious reasons of uh, the Assad regime's willingness to take uh, steps of what is necessary to resolve the serious crisis and uh, take steps that are in the interest of the Syrian people. Uh, but we are aligned with our Arab partners on the ultimate uh, objective here. And second, uh, The Guardian has reported that the U.S. Uh, gave a green light to uh, Saudi Arabia to revive uh, a peace deal with the Houthis despite their ongoing attacks on uh, commercial uh, uh, ships. Uh, ships. Uh, can you confirm? That, that is report? completely inaccurate and uh, uh, reflective of Houthi propaganda. We've been clear and consistent. The U.S. supports peace in Yemen, uh, but a peace agreement can only proceed after the Houthis stop their reckless attacks on international shipping in the Red Sea and surrounding waterways. All of our partners are united around the need for Houthi attacks mm -hmm. to cease uh, before an agreement can be signed. Thanks. Go ahead in the blue. Uh, thank you so much, Vedan. Uh, Igor Nemushin, Iranian Agency. So, regarding Ukraine and Russia, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, during his last visit to Kiev, stated that the United States is set to use the power given by Congress to size frozen Russian assets uh, to Ukraine's recovery and reconstruction. May I kindly ask you to clarify when the U.S. is up to start using assets, in what particular way, and what is the current status of discussions with other G7 members? So I'm certainly not going to assign a timeline to that. What I can say is that we're continuing to consult closely with not just Congress, but other G7 um, and European partners, ensuring that we're looking at processes that are consistent with their legal system as well as consistent with ours. And um, I'm just going to leave it at that for now. DR, and then we probably got to wrap today. Thank you, Go. Fidan. Yeah. Two questions on Assistant Secretary Fayyad's visit to yeah. Baghdad and Arabia. He was in Baghdad yesterday and met with the Iraqi Prime Minister and discussed the Iraqi energy independence from Iraq. 
So are you satisfied with the Iraqi government's steps in this regard? And do you believe that I could achieve this energy independence from Iran? Mm -hmm. So uh, Assistant Secretary Pryde's visit reflects the important strides that we believe Iraq has made to secure its energy independence. And these efforts are important for Iraq and for Iraq to end uh, Iranian natural gas imports and to meet its climate commitments. Uh, Assistant Secretary Pyatt is also encouraging federal government to better integrate the IKR's uh, gas resources into its overall energy independence plans. Uh, we believe that Iraq is making progress, and over the past decade, Iraq has doubled its electricity generation. In March, Iraq activated its electricity interconnection with Jordan. Uh, gas capture projects are coming online this year. That will also significantly reduce Iraq's uh, need to import Iranian gas. And it's been a year that we are working and encouraging Iraq to resume the IKR oil exports to ITP. And what you announced in your statement is that to offset decreases in Russian oil export to Europe. So why this hasn't happened? Why you couldn't convince the Iraqi government to resume that oil export? As it's matter to, to the energy supply, it's matter to American companies, it's matter to... We America. continue to engage directly with officials in Baghdad, and officials in Ankara, officials in Erbil, as well as with U.S. companies that are affected by the stoppage on reopening uh, the uh, ITP pipeline, developing multiple routes for Iraqi energy to flow into global markets. It's a common interest of ours. All right, all thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Briefing that you forgot me. This is a very shameful attitude. The Frontier Post federal pays federal and state taxes. I pay those taxes. You should ask.